today <coughs> theory, turbulence, and turbulence modeling. Um, as you might have noticed, there's a little mix when we have exercises, when we have theory, uh, when we have demonstration of uh, open foam. So um, I play around with it a lot. Uh, quite unstructured actually. It's more like um, uh, I have to think what you need to know for the next exercise. Uh, it will be more and more uh, exercises. Uh, now, this week, it will be uh, theory today, <coughs> turbulence, turbulence models. Tomorrow, then, uh, exercise. Uh, I will uh, start with showing you some hints for exercise number uh, three which is out. <coughs> um, exercise three actually doesn't really cover uh, <coughs> turbulence, but uh, the next one is going to, so we need the turbulence theory here anyway. Uh, exercise three, a little bit about uh, how to extract data from your open foam simulations and getting them over to Windows and uh, playing around with the geometry, changing uh, a square, uh, square cavity test case into an uh, open channel. So that's the B question. But more of exercise three than uh, as hints tomorrow. And then we will do some exercises. So you can, if you like, of course, start with this one, have a peek uh, into it until tomorrow but uh, exercise tomorrow. Thursday morning we will then continue with the theory. We need a little bit more before we can uh, say use open form a little bit more more heavy. <coughs> As a reference uh, book we are now using uh, the one by Fersteg and he has a chapter 3 there covering turbulence. Last time I just gave you a quick overview over uh, turbulence and uh, turbulence models. Today a little bit more detail in uh, the biggest uh, family of uh, turbulence models. The one I called Rans models, Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes models. Before we go into that I will want to show you something that is called well flat plate boundary layer pipe flow it's a law of the wall <coughs> that's something that we are going to need so uh, we take it uh, here <coughs> roughly <coughs> and we start with this one the law of the wall this is something you should have heard about already but uh, for those of you who hasn't Please pay attention. This is sort of <coughs> how far you can get with turbulence. Uh, mm, you have to cheat a little bit to get there. Some uh, dimensional analysis. <coughs> but uh, we say uh, this is <coughs> the truth. We believe this. Law of the wall. <coughs> so. <coughs> We say at a distance perpendicular to a wall, we measure the velocity profile or the velocity, say. Of course, in a real turbulent flow, <coughs> say you have a flow over a plate, uh, the flow is going to change in space and time uh, continuously. Very hard to give a one correct answer here. So the velocity we are measuring here is an average velocity in, in time. The distance <coughs> from uh, the wall, we measure it in something that is called a uh, plus unit. And the velocity, non-dimensionalized also, so it's a uh, u plus there as well. <coughs> now the definitions, <coughs> Uh, yeah, we can take them here. <coughs> First of all, <coughs> uh, you have the 
wall shear stress. That's a quantity quite interesting when uh, studying turbulence, turbulent flows. What's the drag force alongside the wall? Due to the uh, viscosity, the flow tends to drag the plate, the wall, uh, with him. And then this shear stress is uh, very, very much uh, interesting. And this one is, of course, mu. And then the derivative with respect to uh, the cross stream direction at a location uh, down on the solid wall. This is uh, classic fluid mechanics wall shear stress. Now we use this one to create a skin friction velocity. U star. And we define it as the square root of the uh, shear stress divided by the density. This has the dimension of a velocity. Of course, it is not a velocity. Skin friction velocity sort of uh, says something about uh, what is the friction force towards uh, the solid wall. So uh, it's a sort of a, a scale concept. So this u plus, that is the real velocity scaled with this uh, skin friction velocity. Uh, for the u plus, <coughs> we use the same now let's see if we can get this one correct. I think it is U star divided by the kinematic viscosity or vice versa. Now oh, this one should be correct. Look at the dimensions. U star as the velocity, meters per second. So here we will have meters square per second. Viscosity, kinematic viscosity, also meters square per second. So that's uh, dimensionless uh, scale. So uh, <coughs> how big is it then? Remember why that's your real distance in meters. Viscosity, meters square per second. So these are the physical quantities. This is a sort of a non-dimensional length, a turbulent length scale. And what we are plotting here is typically the log uh, of y plus. So here 10, uh, 0, 10, 1 and so on, 10, 2, 10, 3. <coughs> and uh, it turns out then that uh, for y plus say smaller than 10 or something, these two will sort of equals out. So he starts, well, we don't get all the way down to zero in a log scale, but uh, fairly close. So you will start with something like this. And this curve, u plus equals y plus. <coughs> if you now insert, rewrite, reorganize, you will find this actually is the laminar solution. Laminar solution meaning uh, velocity goes as y squared. <coughs> so typically you will call this uh, the, the layer closest into the wall for a laminar sublayer or a viscous sublayer. To call it a laminar sublayer, that's a very, very big lie. That's something you have to be aware of. On average, yes, you get the laminar solution for the velocity profile. That's true. But if you really zoom in to, uh, to the uh, vicinity of a solid wall, really zoom in, say uh, y plus down to um, five, uh, very, very close to the wall, then you will see a velocity profile really violent. That's where all the turbulent action uh, is taking place. So inside this layer, it's really, really rough, really uh, violent, uh, turbulent behavior. Close to the walls, that's where the turbulent uh, will be produced. So here is where all the action is taking place. But strangely enough, on average, it looks like a laminar velocity profile. But is in detail, no, that's not the case. That means if you are planning on doing a DNS, 
there you have to resolve all the essential tur turbulent scales, all the way down to Kolmogorov. How big is a Kolmogorov? Kolmogorov turbulent length scale will be, say, y plus roughly around 1. And to really resolve everything, your first grid cell should be y plus roughly around 0 0.1. And now, if you insert a real flow here, real viscosity, uh, estimate your wall shear stress and find a skin friction velocity here, you will then find your distance has to be 0 0.000 very, very bad. It's going to be really, really small for a real flow. So uh, you can always almost find here a sort of a turbulent Reynolds number, if you look at it, velocity, length by viscosity. So it's actually a turbulent Reynolds number, a local turbulent Reynolds number, this plus units scale. So DNS, oh, very expensive. You really have to resolve everything. Now, <coughs> Uh, y plus equals uh, u plus sort of have, has been found uh, with uh, dimensional analysis saying that uh, we don't have a lot of transport so close to the wall. So uh, where the turbulent uh, is produced, it's also going to be destroyed. It doesn't move around. There's no actual space to move around here. So that's the philosophy behind this one. <coughs> then further out, you will have another philosophy. Uh, again, a lot of uh, dimensional analysis behind this. I won't go through with it uh, in detail. But you have the log, the log uh, law, saying uh, y plus should go like ln to y plus or log y plus. And uh, we have a buffer layer here, so the real behavior should go something like this. <coughs> So uh, viscous sublayer, the log layer, and then the buffer zone. And then further out, then um, depends on the, the free, uh, free flow. Then, then you are talking, uh, what kind of problem do we have here? So very close to the wall. OK, we can believe this law. And actually, it, it, uh, it works out quite nicely, or should work out quite nicely. But with, uh, say, very large y plus, you are very far from the wall. Then you are in the free stream. That depends on your problem, of course. Is it an internal flow inside a channel? Is it a flow around a building, around a motorbike or whatever? Then you are far from the walls. Then this law is uh, not important anymore. <coughs> We will use these, uh, these uh, scales here because <coughs> when we start to simulate here, it's very important to know what should my distance in meters be for my cells close to the wall. How big should, should my first cell be here in meters? That's a choice we have to do when we design the mesh. So it's w it will be a sort of a question. Is it possible to resolve everything here with many, many small delta x's? Or do we have to sort of forget the entire details inside this uh, sublayer, buffer layer, and say, I want my first cell to be really far from the wall. If you are too close, then you have to model it or use this law of the wall. If you are really far from, from the wall at your first uh, cell, OK, then we need uh, some additional uh, wall uh, functions to describe what uh, is going on. But then we are using this law of the wall to create these uh, turbulence wall models. So more of, more of this later. Uh, sadly, <coughs> for a problem, you can't really tell the scales here, uh, y plus, the shear stress before you have done the simulation. So you really don't know him before you have tried. But it's possible to find estimates what is your plus uh, scale in, in turbulent flows. <coughs> 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 
more of that uh, later. Any questions to uh, this one? <coughs> Should be okay. Good. <coughs> then let us jump to Rand's modeling. <coughs> it's a uh, little bit descriptive here, I think. Mm. Ah, you can read this if you like. He talks a lot, so uh, you don't have to read everything here, of course. I will jump more straight to the point. <coughs> Rounds. So that is, uh, ah, we can do it here. Rounds. <coughs> Reynolds averaged Navier Stokes. <coughs> that was the uh, family number three in the turbulence models overview. <coughs> It's a big family, and typically this is where you will use your turbulence models, within this family. So what is the concept? Reynolds averaged. Here you have, say, a measurement in time of the real velocity u in the middle of a turbulent flow. You just uh, insert a probe and then you measure as time goes by. Then you might measure a signal looking something like this. <coughs> a lot of details. Terrible. You will have uh, fluctuating velocities <coughs> uh, in space and time. So here I just focus on one single point in a, in a flow. So this is my signal. That's the real thing. So we have a perfect uh, measurement here. As an engineer, I would now say, I am not interested in all these uh, turbulent details. I want to know what's the average velocity here. So <coughs> I invent a time window here, sort of a delta t. And the size of this window <coughs> then must be uh, big enough so I can get a good average and get uh, rid of all this uh, turbulent noise. It must be small enough so I can still capture sort of the major uh, transient motion of the velocity. So here, hopefully, I will end up with an average velocity that will look something like this. So this one I now call uh, well, what does he use? He use uh, big U. Okay, we can use a big U. That's okay. <coughs> now this one is averaged time averaged. It doesn't have to be only time average, it can also be space averaged. You only need what's called an ensemble, a whole bunch of them, and then you can make an average. But uh, more of that later. For now, think of it as a time, uh, time averaged. This means that we take the real velocity and we split it up into the average part plus and then the part that we are missing. That must now be what we call the fluctuating part. <coughs> so a uh, u prime. That will now be the uh, fluctuating part. So we still have uh, control over the entire truth if we want, but we will now just focusing on this average velocity. That was m that's what we are interested in. We uh, we don't care about all this. Uh, some details. We are engineers, we just want an answer. What's the average speed in a pipe? Then we don't care about the details. <coughs> For the Navier Stokes, <coughs> then we believe, as I said last time, we believe the Navier Stokes cover the entire truth, including this turbulent behavior. And uh, so far nobody has proven otherwise, so yes, we believe it. The Navier Stokes actually can describe this crazy motion. 
So that means if you take a case, any numerical case, you don't have a turbulence model, but you just start to simulate, and then you increase the Reynolds number, meaning e either you increase the input, velo input velocity or, or you lower the viscosity. Sooner or later, this code is going to blow up. Just try with Zula. Not necessarily because it's numerically unstable, but the Reynolds number becomes so big that the flow flips over and becomes turbulent. Then to describe that one, okay, then we know you have to have a lot of cells and you have to have a very small delta t to capture all this motion. This time window, well, we really don't uh, care about how big it is. It's never actually defined in, in seconds <coughs> unless you went into the lab and measured and then you wanted this quantity without this one then you have to actually put some seconds into this uh, definition of a delta t. But uh, here, for the theory part, uh, we don't need to know how big it is. It's just a concept. So uh, u <coughs> sort of uh, 1 over delta t, and then you integrate u dt from time uh, through this time window, large T. <coughs> this is an averaging. So uh, as a symbol, we will use uh, U with a bar over. Yeah, you don't see that one. So let's go up here. <coughs> So this u, that is the time average of little u. So we write it like this. <coughs> u equals the real velocity time averaged. So a bar over, meaning now time average. And uh, what's then, uh, what's happening here? Well, you can think of it as follows. You insert now the velocity, the real thing, but we have split it up into an average and fluctuating part, and then we take time average. Now we have some calculation rules. <coughs> when you take an average of a sum, that is the same as taking the average of each of the components and then make the sum afterwards. That will be mathematically the same. Remember, an average, you just sum up a whole bunch and then take an average divided by the number, the amount. So this one, of course, will be the same. And now, per definition, this one is zero. <coughs> when you have an average over a fluctuating quantity only, he will disappear. That will be the rule. So if we now have... Um, Ah, let's try it. Now we are stoked. <coughs> we want to uh, do this averaging with the entire Navier Stoke. We don't need all the terms, of course, but just take some. <coughs> so now I write it with the real velocities. <coughs> Here only the two-dimensional x component so far. We have the pressure. Uh, I skip the gravity and we have viscosity, double derivative with respect to x and with respect to y if you like. Take time average of the entire equation. Okay, then we can from this mathematical rule say we can take the time average of each term like this. That will now be OK. Also, <coughs> possible to prove mathematically the time averaged of any derivative by any quantity 
equals the same as derivative of the time average quantity. Not surprising. So that one we just uh, buy, we don't prove it. Okay, <coughs> what will happen here? Uh, for this term and this term and this term, you see what happens when you insert average pl plus fluctuating. The fluctuating part is going to disappear. Take a look at uh, the first term here. This one, you now can write d dt as the time average of this guy, which then was u plus u fluct, time averaged. And then this one can now be split into two. So we can do it like this. And finally, this one is zero. <coughs> And you are left with time derivative of the average alone. Time averaged of an average, that's uh, too much information. So, of course, you will end up with only the time derivative of the average velocity. You don't write a time average uh, above him. He is already time averaged. So, he will return this term, time derivative of the average velocity. This one will return the time average of the pressure only, the mean pressure here, also one velocity, no problem. You will only get the, the uh, mean velocity out of it. These guys are the problem. These guys are the problem. Now write it in a conservative form. So then we have uh, ddx of u squared plus d d y of u v. And then time averaged. Okay, we can do it like this and we can do it like this. Now we have a problem because a product between two real quantities, they will not uh, be possible to do so, so uh, simple as just one average part. <coughs> so what's happening here? Uh, let's take the last one. <coughs> he will now read d d y of then I have to insert the real velocities. You will then have uh, u plus u fluct multiplied with average v plus v fluct, like this. <coughs> and then time averaged equals d dy of, what do we get? <coughs> Well, you just have to multiply out and see what happens. <coughs> we will have one term, u multiplied with v, big ones. They will survive. These are the mean uh, velocity fields. So they are not uh, zero. They can be whatever they want, that's okay. Then we will have two terms. You will have one averaged multiplied with one fluctuating and v multiplied with u fluct and then finally plus the last one u fluct multiplied with v fluct like this <coughs> and then time averaged time averaged over these two guys well you don't need it they are already time averaged time averaged here they are interesting they disappear. When you only have one fluctuating quantity and in a term and your time average, per definition, these are going to be zero. They disappear. But this guy, that's the problem. That's the messy one. And this guy, 
to describe him, that is a turbulence model for the Virant's uh, family. How should we describe him? That's the job. Everybody with me so far? So, <coughs> in the Navier Stokes, is these advective, advective or convective acceleration terms, they give birth to this strange uh, uh, a product of two fluctuating quantities. Of course, they may be zero, but uh, in general, no. So they are actually convective acceleration based on turbulent uh, fluid motion. These are acceleration terms. In the uh, Navier-Stokes, we uh, don't call them accelerations. What do we do there? We throw them on, on the other side of the equation sign. Strangely enough. <coughs> Let's see, this was the Navier-Stokes. And now, doing a Rans. <coughs> Reynolds average Navier Stokes. How will uh, the same equation look? You will have time derivative of large u. That's the only one from him. From these two terms, you will then have d dx of big U square plus d dy of big U big V and nothing more equals. What do we get on the other side? You will have minus 1 over density and here a large pressure, an average pressure and here viscosity actually this one we should write like this it's more general, this viscosity doesn't have to be constant in space so we write it like this viscosity and then derivative and here only large u dx and then plus you will have more uh, dv dy and so on and then finally this guy minus uh, what will he be we will have Let's see, this was only from this term. You will have a, exactly the same from this one. So that will now read minus u fluct square time averaged. And then this one, minus u fluct v fluct time averaged. So they appear on the other side with the minus sign. This is the Reynolds average Navier Stokes. Okay? Uh, ah, tuck. Thank you. Of course I do. There should be some d d x in front of this one and then d d y in front of this one. Thank you. <coughs> The equation should be here somewhere. Rans, rans, rans. he talks too much. <coughs> uh, I put out on his learning for you some more uh, material which then I would say is a little bit easier to read. Lecture notes on turbulence modeling. It's a little bit more uh, to, the, uh, to the point. <coughs> Something I've stolen from a course in, uh, a course in, in turbulence. <coughs> by Helge Andersson, so uh, it's an old one, but uh, fairly okay, straight to the point. 
So uh, I think he will then start defining the renal stresses. Come back to that. And then you should have the Navier Stokes somewhere. No, do, 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 no. Mm. Ah, more or less. <coughs> more or less. We'll see how, how this is uh, done. So, yes, it's sort of a Navier Stokes version written here with the tensor notation. So, it's just the I component. Here you sum over the equal uh, index. For the pressure we have all of a sudden an additional term. And for the viscosity we have something an addition there as well. So we will see how uh, this uh, arrives. can write it like this. <coughs> the uh, Reynolds stress <coughs> Reynolds stress or, or turbulent stresses <coughs> they are now called minus density u flocked I U flocked J time averaged tensor form. So this is then a tensor, also called tau I J. Um, when I equals J, okay, then you can sum up all of them. Uh, then it will be U flocked square plus V flux square plus W flux square. But in general, depending on the equations you are looking at, you write it uh, like this. Then the rods will look something like this. Let's see now, we multiply everything with the density and then you will have the derivative, total derivative of a velocity component equal here, then the pressure, average pressure in the i direction. <coughs> and now on the tensor form you will have the dxj of first you will now have the viscosity. Now I multiplied with uh, rho, so this is now the dynamical viscosity multiplied with <coughs> and then you will have large u i d x j plus d u j d x i it's a little messy written but uh, believe me it is correct and then finally minus rho and our u i u j flocked flocked like this <coughs> So here <coughs> you can now see uh, how the Reynolds stresses appears inside the Navier stoke. <coughs> they appear together with the viscous stresses. And as a turbulence model now, a lot of models will uh, substitute this one with something very similar to what we already have. This guy is sort of uh, the averaged viscous stress large S I J. So that's just a gradient of uh, the, uh, the mean velocities. Uh, so they are unknown already. So if we can express this guy uh, with something that's already unknown, that would be very nice indeed. Also, you see, you can then have just an additional viscosity. <coughs> 
which is exactly what they have done here. So you just add sort of a turbulent viscosity called eddy viscosity. This is now what we are aiming for as one simple uh, turbulence model. <coughs> And to do this, we will use what is called an eddy viscosity hypothesis. <coughs> we say that this uh, Reynolds uh, stresses <coughs> which now is identical to minus rho ui uj flocked time averaged can be expressed as um, we can use the yeah, well it doesn't matter um, this one equal to rho kinematic viscosity so here I use rho and now a turbulent viscosity. Oh, sorry. <coughs> New. Eddy viscosity. The one you see right here. <coughs> and then <coughs> multiplied with this large Sij. And for this one to be correct, we have to subtract two-thirds density and a small k, and then a Kronecker delta i j. What's this last part? <coughs> Everybody with me so far? It's okay? Good. This uh, small k <coughs> equals one half u i flocked u i flocked, which then is one half u flocked square v flocked square w flocked square. <coughs> this is the uh, turbulent kinetic energy. You just need a mass. You see you have one half mass times velocity squared. Kinetic energy for the small fluctuating turbulent motion. That is this K. Kronecker delta. Uh, he will be zero if I different from J. <coughs> equal 1 if <coughs> i equals j 0 if they are different so uh, if you just want to check it out that you get what you should here uh, if you put uh, i equal to to j then you have to sort of add up this one so then you should get something like a k here uh, now, if you do the algebra, it turns out that, yes, you need this term for this uh, equation sign to hold. And uh, this additional term here is now joined together with the pressure. So, uh, with this uh, uh, eddy viscosity hypothesis, what have we done? <coughs> well, we started with a Reynolds average Navier-Stokes with how many unknowns? Well, the three velocity components and the pressure say it's incompressible, so the density is OK. But we have here six unknown functions. Six unknown functions. So this uh, doesn't look uh, look good. 
actually this is very, very sad. And we have no idea how these functions actually look like, sort of uh, as a starting point. So six additional functions that we have to find. We have to use them. With this eddy viscosity hypothesis, then we have transferred all these six functions into just one new unknown function together with k. So now we have only two unknown functions. So at least it helps a little bit. So now it's a question how we can uh, proceed. If we knew these two, ah, then no problem. Then we have a variant of the uh, Navier-Stokes that we should be able to solve. <coughs> and that is what we call a turbulence model. Question so far? Then we take a break.